So for this session, we really wanted to focus on how to invest in your future in 2021. This was a follow-up to the session we did last time, which was really on the financial foundations for you. And you know, feel free to leave questions, as I mentioned, um, and we'll try to answer all of them at the end. A quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm a financial coach, so I help people you know, coach them one-on-one -on, -one on their finances. Uh, I specialize particularly in women and first generation, um, specifically because you know, I was you know, the first person in my family to go to college. I had no financial help or advice. And what I really say to people is that financial knowledge really is power. And you know, if you don't get that financial knowledge from your family, um, from your friends, um, which a lot of people do, you know, right out of the gate, um, then you know that puts you at a disadvantage. So you know, the earlier you can learn, really, the better um, to be able to en enable and help you as you grow your career and grow your finances. Uh, beyond this, I'm the co-founder and advisor to Snowball Wealth, which is a platform that helps millennials pay down student debt and personal debt. Uh, so yeah, if you haven't heard about the company, uh, feel free to check it out. It's a great resource and platform for you to really manage those important pieces of your financial life, especially you know, as you graduate college. And you know, just so we cover the bases, I um, wanted to let everyone know, you know I'm not a financial planner. I'm, I'm not really here to give you individual financial and investment advice. What I'm giving you here today is really, uh, you know, information, research to really help you make a better informed decision yourself on, you know, really how to look at your finances. And, you know, obviously it's a lot of information, uh, so I'll only be covering the basics in an hour, but happy to follow up after the presentation if people really want to, you know, like ask me a specific question one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Yeah, so with that, I'll um, kick it off. I think um, it sounds like uh, we answered a lot of the questions earlier on where people were from, what year they were. And it sounds like it's a mix of uh, like juniors, seniors, um, some freshmen, sophomores, and for majors all across. Um, yeah, and just curious um, for everyone in this group, um, I guess how many people are sort of like the first in your family to go to college? You can raise your hand maybe with the little um, emoji. Okay, so yeah, a good amount of you. And how many people um, have started investing? That's another question. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of you um, have started to do that or dabbled in it. So some of this might be a little bit more basic, but hopefully um, it can give you a really good foundation for how to think about investing in yourself. Today in this presentation, we'll really be covering high yield savings accounts, what they are, how to get them started. Uh, we'll be looking into a 401k, which is really you know, the first thing you need to think about once you get a job out of college. Uh, investing in your first stock. Um, you know, this is something where you know, I don't normally say you know, invest in a stock you know, if you have student debt, but I think given um, a lot of people today are very FOMO about investing and you know, getting in some way. Um, so I do wanna cover it for people who are interested and then going really into Q&A. So, um, so this, this uh, presentation is a bit more tactical because we're really diving a little bit deeper into certain topics. And before I get started in the topics, I um, really want to mention that you know, the first presentation was really financial foundations. And how many people, raise your hand if you attended that first session, just so I know. Okay, so it sounds like a couple of you, but not too many, which, which actually uh, you know, is, uh, Good, so yeah, so make sure um, if you haven't attended that presentation, um, it's always good to revisit it. That's really the financial foundations, um, including setting up an emergency savings fund, um, budgeting, uh, how to find your credit score and how to manage it, uh, any personal debt, student debt you have and how to think about the debt and dabble, going a little bit into investing in retirement. Um, but for this presentation specifically, we won't really cover those topics too much. So I just wanna make sure you know you have that foundation to make the best informed financial decisions, you know, for your specific situation. So first off, um, how many people have a high yield savings account already? Okay, so so a few of you, um, could you share in the ch chat box um, who your high yield savings account is with? That might be helpful for other people. Just curious. 
Yeah, and while you're sharing it, um, so yeah, high yield savings account, it's really a bank account where you're earning money on your money. So, you know, if you deposit, you know, say $5,000 in the account, yeah, money is earning money for you, even th though it's just sitting there. Um, so, you know, we usually advise that, you know, if you have a bank account, you know, a checking account, it's always good to also have a savings account because, you know, if you start to grow your emergency savings, you have just money just parked there, you know, it's in a checking account, it's basically earning nothing. So, you know, it's, it's sort of like free money that you're giving away because you're not doing anything with it. So, um, so that's definitely the first thing you can do to start investing in your future. And this is something that you can use, you know, throughout your financial life. So it won't just be, you know, for a short time. One thing to note is that uh, for the high yield savings account, like if you do get one, you wanna make sure that your account is at a bank. And the reason is because at a bank, your high yield savings account will be FDIC insured, which means that, you know, if anything happens, um, you know, in the early days uh, when the financial economy was crashing, people basically went to the banks and drew out all their money and then you wouldn't be able to have any money in your account. So, you know, in order to avoid that happening, um, the institution sets that, you know, every account holder has up to 250,000 in protection in their money. Um, so that's really important. Um, and I would recommend that, you know, anyone who does start a bank account, um, high yield savings, that they check that it's FDIC insured. Um, the other thing, you know, about a high yield savings account is that you basically earn interest on the money. So that interest rate that you earn, it's different depending on the bank that you go to. And it changes over time at any time, depending on um, the economy. But what's nice about it is that at least it's earning some money. Um, two examples that I give is, you know, the first example, you're putting $10,000 into an account, it only earns 0.01%. So in a year, you have basically a dollar. Um, in the second example, you know, you have $10,000, it earns 0.50% interest, uh, which is the rate that we're seeing today. And in that example, you're earning $50 after one year. And, you know, even though that doesn't seem like a crazy amount, um, you know, it's still money that you're earning that where you don't have to do anything with it. <laughs> like you're basically just putting the money in an account. And the other thing is that, you know, once that you earn that money, that money gets added to the 10,000 that you have in your account. And after that, that money keeps growing, uh, which is uh, what people term compounding, where your money keeps on growing on additional money. So. so yeah, that's really digging into what exactly is a high yield savings account. Now, how do you actually start one? Um, first, you should decide how much you want to allocate uh, between your high yield savings account and your checking. Uh, people usually recommend that, you know, for your checking, that's something where, you know, you need access to the money right away. Um, you know, there's a debit card where you can go to a bank, you can draw it out. Um, so we would recommend that you, you put uh, some amount of money, you know, you might say $1,000 um, to be able to access it at any time. And then the rest you can put into a savings account where, you know, if you eventually do need a large amount of money, you can always transfer that to the checking account. Um, because sometimes these uh, high yield savings account won't have uh, like ATM or debit access. Uh, the second thing to do is really pick a bank to open it with. Um, so I am not affiliated with any of these organizations. <laughs> these are uh, banks that, you know, we've just reviewed to see what the highest rate could be and uh, based on the attributes that we liked. Um, so there's some names there like Ally, which is a purely online bank, um, Alliant Credit Union, American Express, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Um, so at the end of the presentation, there's a resources page where I have a blog uh, that I've written in conjunction with Snowball, just going through each of these banks and saying, you know, the pros and cons of each. But, you know, all of my accounts also may offer higher interest rates because in general, those accounts, there isn't actually a physical location so they can save money on that. And in general, when you try to pick a bank account, uh, pick one that has, you know, a high rate for you, uh, lower no fees, that's really important. Um, that's something I learned pretty early on <laughs> that sometimes, you know, like for example, Bank of America, I started an account and basically I was charged like $30 every single month um, for going below my balance. And that was a very hard lesson to learn. Um, so make sure basically, like I would advise no fees. Um, that's really important. Yeah, no, that's great. Someone else, um, not great, but someone else actually had to experience those fees. Um, those can really get you if you don't catch up, if you don't sort of check your statement. Um, the other thing is FDIC insured. Uh, I would say good customer service if you care about that. Um, and then finally, you know, if you do need access, some also provide you access um, and also an ATM card. So, so yeah, that's something that you could look out for. And you know, the next step would be to open the account. 
uh, try to transfer the money that you don't need to use, um, like within the immediate, I would say like three months, um, depending on your situation. Um, and then after that, you know, you'll have a checking account, you have a savings account. And for your checking account, like whenever you get cash above the amount that you need, you can put it into your savings account or transfer it. So your savings is always growing. And yeah, so, so that's it. And after that, you can really see your money grow. So, so that's the, really the first step we would advise in you know, making money uh, with the money that you currently have. And I see a lot of questions coming up, so I will try to uh, save those till the end. Although some of them I can probably answer now. Yeah, I think some people, um, one last question is, why is it better to have a funds in a high yield savings account versus dollar cost averaging in an ETF? Um, yes, yeah, so I think the difference really is, you know, high yield savings account, that's money that you put into the bank account. It's insured by an um, institution and the money is there no matter what. And it's earning a set rate. Whereas if you invest in an ETF, um, which is a type of you know investment that you can make, like that for that you know it can go up or down, um, you know, and it's not guaranteed. So you know if the stock market is really volatile, it can maybe go up twenty percent, down twenty percent. You don't know. Um, so, but then that being said, like it can go up a lot, but that's sort of the risk you're taking. Um, so it's more of you know how much risk do you want? Um, we usually recommend specifically for a savings that you have three to six months in emergency savings that can cover your living expenses. And for that money specifically, you, you put that into either checking your savings so you have that money um, so that it won't go up and down of the market and you won't be able to access it potentially. Okay. And yeah, one other question to ask, what causes these entities to be able to provide higher yields as opposed to the usual local bank? Um, yeah, it usually is through, um, you know, savings that they can get through their financial structure. Um, so it, it's on a case by case basis. Uh, but I've generally seen like Ally Bank, for example, they're mostly online, and they've been able to offer a higher yield. And last thing, um, so high yield savings account, same as a normal savings account. Um, yeah, a normal one, high yield basically just means it has high interest. Um, it's just a term that you put on top of a savings account. Um, so I would say for, if you wanna get, you know, earn the most on your savings account, I would definitely look into ones that offer the highest interest or high yield. So next I'm gonna dig into the 401 account. Um, so how many people are graduate or seniors who are going to graduate soon? Okay, so a good amount of you. So this will probably be more important um, for the seniors in the group. Although I think, you know, junior sophomores, it's definitely important to understand this so that when you get your first job, you know, you can just be ready right out the gate. Um, so a 401k account, that's really a retirement savings and investing plan that your employer sets up for you. And the contributions, they're automatically withdrawn from your paycheck. Um, contributions are capped, which means you can only contribute a certain amount each year, which, you know, for 2021, it was 19,500 if you were just an individual. Uh, one thing to remember is that, you know, retirement account, the money that you put in, that's yours. And if you leave the company, you, you can also take that money away with you. So why is a 401k so important? Why do people always talk about it? Um, I think the number one thing that, you know, people always mention is employee matching. So, you know, that's one thing that I would definitely um, take a hard look at. And what that really means is that, you know, you put in some money into your retirement account and your employer is also putting some money into it. Uh, it's a great way for, um, for you to actually grow your money because what it's saying is that, you know, your employer is basically giving you free money for contributing to your retirement. And the way it works is that, you know, employees, employers will have different ways to write about it or talk about it, but they could say, you know, dollar for dollar, up to 6% of contribution amount. So what that means is, they'll give you a dollar for a dollar that you put in up to 6% of your salary or, you know, 50 cents on the dollar. That means they'll put in 50 cents for each dollar that you put in up to 6% of your salary. And walking through real examples, you know, if you make 60,000, you have a dollar for dollar up to 6%, that would be, you know, you putting in 3,600, your employer putting in 3,600, 
And that really adds up, um, you know, towards like every single year if they're contributing to that, you know, I would say that really snowballs or compounds. And in the second example, you know, if you make 60K, 50 cents on the dollar means they put in 50 cents for the dollar you put in up to 6%, then, you know, you would put in 3,600 and your employer would put in 1,800 for you, which, you know, is, it's still a lot of money that you'd be able to get. So, and then the second thing is um, for a 401k, what's nice about it is that for a traditional 401k, uh, the contributions are pre-tax, which means uh, the taxes that you pay each year, they're going to be lower by the amount you contribute to your traditional 401k. And what that means is um, you're able to put in more money into the account today. So that money can grow and it will grow a lot faster because it's more money. And you know, in the future, it'll eventually get taxed. But for right now, um, you're able to save money on the taxes. Um, one thing that also people have thrown out, um, oh. which I don't know if you've heard about this, is a Roth 401k. And that's really where, uh, you know, it's similar mechanism to the 401k, but the main difference is that for a Roth, the contributions are actually post-tax. So um, what that means is that the money you're putting in, you've already paid taxes in. So you pay taxes today, but what's great about it is that in the future, um, you don't have to pay taxes on it. So that money can just keep on growing and growing and growing, and you know you won't have taxes in the future. So I think choosing between the two, you know, it's really dependent on your tax situation um, and what, uh, like what, you know, you decide to do. Um, speaking from personal experience, um, I, th I thought I personally would prefer to pay taxes today um, and do the Roth if I can, because in the future, I think that like my tax bracket will be a bit lower. So, um, so oh, sorry, my tax bracket will potentially be higher. And, and I like the fact that I don't have to pay taxes or worry about in the future. Um, so that's why I contributed to my Roth earlier, so. Yeah, does that make sense? I know this topic, um, sometimes the traditional versus the Roth pre post tax can get a bit confusing for people. Raise your hand if, um, or if you have any questions or if it makes sense to you, I guess, yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I do have a question. Is it okay to just ask it in this space? Uh, yeah, maybe you can chat it because um, we might not, um, depending on the question. Yeah, so just remember, um, you know, traditional means pre-tax, um, Roth, that term is post-tax. Uh, and either way, you'll pay taxes at some point, but it's either paying today or pay paying in the future. So how do you actually get started uh, setting up your 401k? Uh, so what you do is um, right when you sign your offer letter, usually they'll give a list of the benefits that you can get. Um, one thing to note is, you know, beyond your retirement benefits, you could also have uh, like healthcare benefits, um, say a uh, sort of transportation benefits, make sure you get that whole thing. And if you can try to utilize it all. Um, and then what's next? So from your employer, you wanted to find out what type of plans they offer, um, what are the traditional Roth, uh, you wanna find out from them, you know, if they do employee matching, um, what that structure is like and understand if that employee matching actually goes in traditional Roth, because sometimes they'll say, you know, we only put employee matching in a traditional. Um, but, you know, it's not a big deal because you can set up both with your company if they offer it. Uh, next thing is that you open an account with the provider, then you take advantage of the employee matching, which, you know, it's like free money. So, you know, definitely, um, like, that's the one thing I highly recommend if possible. And, you know, one thing to note, a, a big question that people always ask is how much of my income should I be contributing to retirement? Um, I think that's a very individual question because it really, really depends on you know, how much student debt you have, how much personal debt you have, um, what your emergency savings is, uh, especially I think for a lot of first gen um, students, you know, do you need to contribute to anything else outside of your own personal finances? Um, so, you know, 10 to 15% is the recommended, but I would really say, you know, if it's possible, try your best to contribute to get the employee matching. And then every single year, you know, consider bumping it up a little bit, maybe like 1%, you know, 0.5%, 2%, depending on what else is in your life. Okay. So, yeah, and the next, um, you know, if your employer doesn't offer 401k, you should look into an IRA, which is an individual retirement account. And for that one, there's also pre and post tax. Um, the one difference is that for this one specifically, um, 
for instance, there's like there's caps to it. So it wouldn't be the 19,500 that you can contribute, but you know, it could, it would be a lower amount. So yeah, and I think the one question that popped up is um, as an older person, you would be in the lower bracket because you're presumably retired, so your income is lower. Um, so yeah, that's a very, it really depends on your situation. Um, I've, I would say like, there's there's a certain group of people, for example, who um, when they retire, they, they actually have a lot of income generating assets. Um, like they have, you know, five rental properties, uh, you know, the like. And so they actually end up probably paying the same taxes or more at the bracket. So it, it's really dependent on um, your specific situation and whether you want to pay taxes like today or in the future. Yeah, so hopefully, I'm hoping that everyone in this group, you know, um, even by the time you retire as an old person, um, you'll be able to, you know, generate lots of wealth through different assets. So, um, so yeah, I think that's sort of like the best case scenario. Yeah, but yeah, that's a great question um, because that was something I sort of had contemplated also. And, and I think the general advice is that as you get older, you're in the lower bracket, but it's not always the case. Yeah. And yeah, you can ha definitely have um, both an IRA and a 401k. Um, it's just, you know, one's through your employer, one's through your um, individual personal. Um, and yeah, and one, one topic too, which I don't know if this gets too much in depth and happy to follow up with it later. But um, for a 401k specifically, as I mentioned, it stays if you're employer. And if you leave, it's still yours. Um, but what a lot of people do is they actually, you know, if you have four jobs, for example, and all four of them have a different 401k, what you can do is you can actually roll all of them over into one IRA um, called an rollover IRA. And um, that's actually advantageous because you only have one place that you need to go now, not four different places or four different, you know, investment strategies. Um, and the other good thing is like for an IRA, actually, um, you can pretend you have different types of investment uh, vehicles that you can actually access, whereas a 401k is a little bit more rigid. And, you know, generally, um, you know, people recommend that for 401k, the fees are a little bit more expensive. Um, and for an IRA, you can have invest in things that have lower fees. Yeah, that's a little bit, um, you know, later when you, you do have a 401k, but, you know, as a first step, at least, you know, set one up um, and then get your employer to to match it and take benefit, take the benefit of, you know, that full matching. Um, and, and definitely uh, when you look at your offer package, make sure that you look at that matching package um, because it, it can actually, you know, be a huge sum that you don't factor into your total compensation. So next up, I really want to touch on you know, a little bit of investing. Um, I know it's a topic where, um, you know, a lot of the financial foundations workshops won't really go through investing, because, mainly because a lot of the traditional advice is you should have an emergency savings account of three to six months. Um, you shouldn't have a lot of debt. And, you know, most students, I would say, have a lot of student debt. You know, so that's something that, you know, you, you sort of start off with. Um, and, you know, you don't have large financial obligations, which I think is, is a bit tough to um, with a lot of first gen because, you know, usually you have there's financial obligations where, you know, for example, I had to help pay for my mom, um, you know, monthly after I graduated, like a certain amount um, to help her household. But what, what I would say is that um, investing in general, you know, it's really popular nowadays. Like, you know, I, I think there is a way where you could potentially start looking into investing, um, but not do it in a way where it would harm your other financial, you know, pieces of your life. So this is in no way advocating that you should go off and start, you know, investing lots of money. But you know, I'm just really uh, showing you and explaining to you like what investing could mean or what you could do on a very small scale. And one thing to note too is that um, when you put money into your retirement, that's actually a huge form of investing, and that's probably you know the biggest dollars you'll put into investing. Um, so a lot of people often overlook that. So I, I would just make sure you know when you put money into your 401k or you put it into you know, an IRA, that you make sure that uh, money is getting invested and you, you make sure you understand what type of uh, investments it's actually going into. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, maybe from people, uh, like what investment platforms are people using or investing in, um, the people that raise their hands? Because I know the last session, we had a lot of advanced investors already. <laughs>
Okay, perfect. So it sounds like um, Robin Hood um, TD. I actually haven't heard of Voyager, so I'll check that out. Um, Gemini, it sounds like some people are doing uh, crypto, which uh, that's interesting too. Yeah, so I would say um, for investing, um, you know, for just for investing, make sure you invest only what you're willing to lose um, because investing, you know, it, there's a spectrum of it, but they can get from really risky to moderately risky. But either way, um, because you're earning a return, you know, there is a certain risk that's attached to it. Um, so I don't, I don't like to ever say like, oh, invest or don't invest in crypto currencies, for example, which, you know, people would potentially would consider very high risk, um, but just more like, you know, are you willing to lose that money and can you afford to lose that money um, that you're investing in? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, got, there's good advice that I had a teacher say, don't invest money that you may need over the next five years. Yeah, so that's really um, good conventional advice and wisdom. It really, um, you know, be willing to invest something you'd be willing to lose. So yeah, then that usually means very small amounts. So, so yeah, so what I usually recommend um, is, you know, how can you actually start investing if you really want to? Um, because, you know, you can't really stop someone if they really want to do it. What I would say is, um, really look at your retirement account and see what you're invested in. Um, you know, by actually starting early with your retirement account and, you know, actively understanding that, like you can actually make a really good return and grow that portfolio to a huge amount, um, you know, over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so that's, I think the first thing that you can do um, that people usually underestimate. Uh, I think the second thing is, um, you know, you can start reading some beginner investing books dabbling a little bit. Um, it's always great to start early and really understand it, um, mainly because, you know, the more you understand, really, you know, the more knowledgeable you can be and um, get an early start to it. Uh, the third thing I would recommend is um, to only really invest a small amount if you really want to. Um, and that could be, you know, $50 a month, um, a certain amount a year. But you know, just a small amount where, you know, similar to, you know, if you were to go out and you were to gamble, um, like that's money that you would be willing to lose, you know, if something happens. Because as much as, um, you know, people are earning money in the market, um, you know, stocks have been extremely volatile. Um, and for those who don't know what vol volatile means, it, it's really, you know, it goes up and down a lot. Um, so it's really like swings. And um, I think the fourth thing is, um, which I think I found, um, some of the people I've coached who really do want to do investing and I can't really stop them uh, is to think about investing in the expenditure. So, you know, if you have your budget and you have all the expenses that you have, um, think about like some trade-offs you can make. You know, for example, if you go to dinner twice a month um, and you go to like a nicer restaurant, like could you not do that and have that money as your little, you know, like investment fund? Um, you know, because that actually, you know, it could be a hundred, hundred twenty dollars a month. And you know, that's a good chunk that you could already start to invest. Um, so that's a good way to think about it where you, know, you won't feel guilty about it and it won't dig into all the other parts of your financial life. Here are some books um, that we've gotten from the Snowball community um, of beginner investing books. Uh, I've read, so I, I wanna vouch that I have read only um, the first one, I will teach you to be rich and The Intelligent Investor. Um, the Intelligent Investor, it's a little bit of, it's, it's really great uh, sort of going through the deep dive and details of investing, um, but sometimes it can be a little bit dry, um, but I really enjoy the concept of value investing. Um, and I will teach you to be rich. That's just another uh, book that uh, people, a lot of times, um, yeah, it, it's been a very popular book. So um, I think it's like worth a read just for inspiration, just for knowledge, just to learn about you know, how different people think about things in life. So this ninth chart, um, just talking about investing as a whole um, and the market, this shows the S&P 500 and really um, sort of where its value has gone from the 60s to today. Um, one thing I want you to notice is that, you know, it goes up and down, up and down, um, where, you know, the bear market means, you know, it plummets significantly where the yellow is. Um, but, you know, over the long term, even if you were, for example, to invest in 2000, you know, it plummets in 2000, it plummets again in um, 2010, 2008. 
um, no matter what, you're still up over the long run. So I think it's very powerful um, to understand for people you know, who are going into investing or who are setting up retirement accounts. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you see in the news, you know, traders or people who go into the market really quickly um, will make a lot of money. But, you know, even if you don't do, if, but if you don't do that and you literally just, you know, park your money into a vehicle um, in general that tracks the market, you know, the market overall has still performed and you've been able to get a really good return, you know, even without timing when you enter the market. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to say like that slow and steady, just you and investing over time, you know, contributing, um, you know, still ha is really powerful. Yeah, and I think that's something um, that I wish I had learned earlier, but um, I think it's something like really to hit home um, that, you know, sometimes you, like you, if you do invest or for your retirement, you might just want a portion of it where you can just set it and forget it um, so that you can, you know, see it in 20 years and it's grown significantly. Yeah, so I think the last thing uh, is really how do you invest in your first stock? Uh, it seems like some of you are already knee deep in investing, but uh, for those who are not, um, what you want to do first is sign up for an investment platform. Um, so you can sign up for, you know, there's Fidelity and Schwab, which are more traditional investment platforms. Um, nowadays, some of them will do something where you can only buy a fraction of a stock. So that's nice because if you can't afford, you know, Tesla, for example, because it's really high, you can just buy a portion of it. Um, and I think for them also, they've started to do something where they have no trading fees, um, similar to Robinhood, where you don't have to pay every single time you trade a stock. So, so that's also helpful. Um, yeah, so make sure wherever you sign up that, you know, there isn't an account minimum, so you won't get charged for things and that there aren't trading fees as well. Yeah, and then um, someone mentioned on the chat too, if anyone has referral codes for the platforms you use, so feel free to enter them in too, so that people uh, can get, some perks because I know Robinhood gives you a free stock <laughs> and I don't know about the other ones. Um, yeah, and then so, you know, ways you can invest. Um, first off, uh, you know, there's an ETF, which is an exchange trade fund that tracks, you know, an index, a sector, et cetera. Um, for an ETF, you know, what I do like about this vehicle is that it's a bit more diversified. Um, diversified means that, you know, because you're investing in, you know, a lot of different things, you know, potentially across different sectors or, um, you know, different types of companies that, you know, when the market goes up or it's affected by something, you know, they won't all go down or up at the same time. So you're exposed to more. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of different ETFs um, and I showed two in the next page, but that's something, you know, could be worth considering if you just want more broad exposure. Um, another thing you could do is, uh, you know, if you do want to invest in individual stock, you know, that's more risky because you are investing in one specific stock. Um, you know, one example is I think Tesla, which um, people might have tracked, but that company has, you know, gone really up and really down. Um, so you're basically taking all that risk. So you could have bought at a really high rate and, you know, ended up, you know, a month later, um, you know, losing most of your money in it. So, so yeah, I would just be careful about the individual stocks you invest in and only invest what you're willing to lose. And I think, I think the last point about investing is, um, you know, it's always helpful to know what you're investing in it and believing in it long term. Um, there is another investment cell, which is a trading I mentioned, um, which, you know, that's something I'm not going to cover uh, because, but, you know, where you can make money, but it's totally different. Um, but yeah, I, I think like the best way is really, you know, know what you're investing in and, you know, don't just invest in something where like a friend might have said like, oh, you know, this stock is interesting and it went up X or um, I don't know if people have been following uh, the ask Reddit, the Wall Street bets on Reddit. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that can sometimes be a little bit uh, tricky. So, so yeah. Yeah, and here um, just some examples of ETFs here. So, um, you know, for example, here are two. One is the Vanguard 500 Index Fund. Uh, one is the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. Um, so what these ETFs do is they they track uh, the certain stocks or indices. Um, in the VOOO case, it tracks S&P 500. So there's 500 stocks within the fund and there are large cap companies, uh, which means um, you know, they're much bigger. In the VTI, um, they're tracking the total stock market and it's actually 3,500 stocks. Um, so it's both small and mid. Uh, so it's a lot of different types of 
you know, stocks that you would own in this uh, one, you know, ETF. Um, and, you know, some things in ETFs that might be helpful are expense ratio. Um, that just means, you know, how, how much is, are you paying for, to operate the fund versus, um, you know, the fund's assets? Um, so yeah, so that's something to check just a lot of times, um, just to make sure that, like, you know, the expenses aren't crazy. So yeah, I think um, that is it for the presentation.